Hey guys, what's going on? Um, hope you're all staying warm. We are switching into equilibrium of a rigid body. Um, it's going to be really similar to kind of last week. I would say even we kind of started working on this without really identifying that's what we were working on. Um, so before rigid bodies, our focus is particles, right? Everything we've done has been interacting with one point and the exception would be kind of some of the things we started last week, um, including this homework problem. Um, so basically, let's get forward a little bit. What a rigid body is, I guess we'll stick with, with these pictures. What a rigid body is, is a um, two-dimensional or three-dimensional figure. Um, and what would happen then is obviously with, with these things, we're seeing that they're getting translational forces and moments because we're working with a rigid body. This would be considered a rigid body. Our, our forces are also introducing moments. Um, yes, we saw that with particles, but it would be like, it would be, it would be a little bit different. Um, kind of some things that we need to talk about. Um, just a reminder that static equilibrium means that there is no movement, there's no rotation or translation, meaning sliding, X, Y, Z um, movement. Um, so in order to be in static equilibrium in an equilibrium situation with a rigid body, we would need our summation of forces to be equal to zero and also our summation of moments to be equal to zero. Um, Going into rigid bodies, I think free body diagrams become even more important because we, we have to identify more what are we, where, what are the boundaries of our problem? Where are we breaking things apart? Um, so when we look at problems like, hmm, there's been problems that we've had where we would kind of break them apart. Um, certain ones where there's threads in them and we're talking about the boundaries of our, our um, free body diagram. So for your free body diagram for rigid bodies, you need to identify what are we analyzing. So in this case, we have a spatial diagram of a weight on a crane. Okay, so what type of forces are impacting that? First, we have to identify what area are we analyzing for forces. So obviously we want the body of the crane. Um, we don't wanna include this wall here. So I'm gonna just make a break here. Um, and anywhere, let's even, let's even shrink this down a little bit. Anywhere you make a break, you need to introduce a force. So right here, we broke this thread. We need to introduce a force for weight here. Um, this is our center of gravity of this crane. So the weight of the crane is gonna be focused on the center of gravity of the crane. And then we have our two points over here. A is called a pin joint and B is a rocker. Um, and we'll need to introduce forces for, for those things. Um, so this is kind of what I was trying to focus on. Select the body to be analyzed detach it from the grounds and all other bodies or supports. A and B would both be supports in this situation. So rollers, this is what we saw. We saw the rocker on that. Anything, when we're talking about reaction forces, that's what we're going to call these, anything that creates a force from something like this. When we're talking about reaction forces, we want them to apply a force in a way that, in the way that it restricts movement, not in the way that it allows movement, but in the way that it restricts movement. So with rollers, rockers, whatever, our, our objects are still free to move left and right. Um, we have these uh, wheels, rollers, whatever, it's gonna slide left and right. Here, there's a pin that connects them, which means that there's still some re rotational freedom between this and our roller. So we're able to move in these ways, 
the ways that our movement is constrained is with this, we're not able to move up or down, right? We can't go through the ground. That's how our rollers are constraining our motion. So we're gonna add that constraint in. So rollers, wheels, rockers, or okay. something on a frictionless surface. Huh? We're sorry, did somebody say something? Um, did someone say something? Um, I muted you all. If you have anything, just unmute and uh, jump back in. Um, okay, so we're going to introduce forces in the way that we're constraining motion. Um, cables and links, links are going to behave like cables. Cables we're used to, right? It's going to give a force in line with that cable. That's pretty much what our focus was when we were doing our unit vectors um, equal your vector over the magnitude of the vector, right? It's a little messy, but um, so we know that our cables are going to restrict force in the direction of the cables. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, let's erase all ink. Um, I would not be super concerned with this one down here. This is not really going to be something that you see until probably your dynamics class. Um, the three that we're going to focus on here is going to be our rollers, rockers, et cetera, because we've experienced this before. We should be familiar with this. And then um, these, this slide would be the other most important ones. This is a pin that would be similar as the pin joint. Sometimes you'll see it looking kind of more like a tombstone with a dot in the middle. Um, it's going to, so because there's a pin here, this is this block is fixed to the ground, right? There's a pin in here. So we're still able to rotate around. We still have that rotational freedom, but we're not able to slide up and down and we're not able to slide left and right. So our constraints are that up and down, left and right. Um, when we go to our, um, fixed support, fixed support is like, if you were to like a lot of times in construction environments and smaller construction environments, you'll have like a bucket of cement that you, or a, a, a vat of cement that you put your beams into to help make sure that they are as secure as possible. So what you're doing is giving it like strong structure around it. I don't know why my mouse keeps glitching like that, but you're giving it strong structure around it. And so it's constraining motion in every way. We can't slide anyway, and we can't rotate other than the rotation that'll happen from the bending of our, our metal material. But there's no freedom of rotation at that joint itself. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, so here would be another example. Um, so let's get a free body diagram together for this. A 2,100 pound tractor is used to lift 900 pounds of gravel, determine the reaction at each of the two rear wheels and the two front wheels. First create a free body diagram and then apply the equilibrium equations. So here's our spatial diagram. This is what it looks like. Our boundaries are right around here. So we're making breaks between the wheels and the ground. Because they're wheels, they're still able to roll left and right, um, but we're not able to go through the ground, right? So we're getting our constraints here. We're gonna have, usually I'll call this like a R of B, um, sometimes BY maybe, um, whereas this one would be R of A or AY. Um, so both of our wheels would have vertical forces applied there. We would have our 900 pounds from our bucket. And then at our center of gravity, we have that 2,100 pounds. Oops. Um, I was hoping that they would go through the uh, the math for me, but let's pick a pick a spot to analyze. So if we had to, I'm gonna do this also. Let's do that. 
if we had to analyze a spot on this tractor thing, um, so we need our summation of forces in X. Our summation of forces in X equals zero. There is no X force in this image. Our summation of forces in Y equals zero because we're in equilibrium. So we know that our positive forces are gonna equal our negative forces. Um, so we'll have a 2,100 plus 900, so a 3,000 equals FB plus FA. And that is our from our summation of forces in X direction. Then the next thing that we would have to do is summation of moments. Um, in this case, no matter what we did, we would have enough information to solve for both of these. But let's say, I don't know. Let's say we had another unknown that we needed to solve for. And either way, it'll make it easier to solve if we use either FA point A or point B as our point of analysis for our moment, right? So our summation of moments also needs to be zero. If we do our summation of moments at point A, FA is giving zero moment impact. So we'll have one equation to solve for FB. And likewise, if we were to do an analysis of point B, FB would have no moment impact because the perpendicular distance is zero. Um, and so we would be able to solve for FA. I'm going to start with, <laughs> pardon me, guys. Um, the moment about A is equal to, okay, so this 2,100 pounds is going to go cause a clockwise rotation. So our clockwise is our negative, negative 2,100 times that perpendicular distance of 20 inches. Our, we also know this is equal to zero just because it's equilibrium, right? Um, our B would cause a rotation in the opposite direction. So we'll make that positive. FB or RB or whatever, whatever you want to call it, FB um, times 40 inches plus 20 inches is 60 inches. And then our final force is going to be going in the negative direction. So it's going to give us a negative moment based on where the point we're in analyzing. Um, so we'll have a negative 900 pounds times 50 plus 60. So our perpendicular distance is this 50 plus 40 plus 20. Um, and so that's going to be 110. So now we have an equation. If this all equals zero, we can solve for FB. Then we can go and plug in and solve for FA. Questions here? So when we're talking two dimensions, um, our equilibrium equations are going to be the summation of forces in X and Y equals zero and our summation of moments in X and Y equals zero. Um, when we're talking 3D, summation of forces in X, Y, and Z equals zero and summation of moments in X, Y, and Z equals zero. Um, so if we're working with, we can only, determine, solve for as many unknowns as we have equations. So if we're working with two-dimensional structures, two-dimensional rigid bodies, we are going to be able to solve for less of the unknown values um, because we'll have, not less of the unknown values, most of the time the problem will give you less unknown values. Um, but you're gonna have less equations, so you're gonna have less variables that you can solve for. Um, whereas in 3D, you get that those two extra equations, the summation of forces and the summation of moments. Um, one thing that we're also going to look at is um, coming up, it's going to be a little bit later in the term, but we'll have trusses. And what we'll see is that using our connection points even if it gives us more unknown values, if we were to explode this, explode this diagram and look at every single force individually, um, that also is gonna give us more equations so we can solve for more information. Um, okay, so here is that same problem from before, but now we've been introduced to our pin joints and our rockers. Um, a fixed crane has a mass of 1000 kilograms and is used to lift 
2,400 kilogram crate. It's held in place by a pin at A and a rocker at B. So remember our pins are going to have two constraints. This is like welded here. So we're not able to move left and right, up and down. Um, we're not able to move any of that. Our rocker is only gonna constrain perpendicular to the surface. So if we were to go back to those, these, these are all assuming that our contact point is with the ground. If it's not, if we have a, I don't know why it keeps doing that. We have a roller on a wall um, or a wheel on a wall or anything like that. It's going to create a force perpendicular to that contact point. Um, so in this case, perpendicular to that contact point is in our X direction. Um, so this one gives us more equations to work with. So that might be good too. So here's our free body diagram. We have AX and AY, and then we have our force at B, reaction force at B. Determine B by solving the equations for the sum of moments of all forces about point A. In this case, so I always prefer to find, solve the moments about, if there's a pin joint, usually that makes sense as the place to solve for the moments because you have two unknown forces there. So if you were to analyze point A, AX and AY both have no moment impact because they go straight through point A. Intuitively, naturally, I just go for the pin joint. However, in this case, if something is in line with the pin joint, um, if we were to analyze point B, we would also get rid of two unknown values. It's just less obvious to see. So this B would have no moment impact because the line of action goes straight through it. And A, A, Y would have no moment impact because the line of action still goes straight through it. So it's just something to keep in mind. But in general, you want to take your, do your moment analysis on some point that um, is going to get rid of the most unknown values. So our moment about A equals zero because we are in equilibrium. Let's go with our horizontal force first. So BY times perpendicular distance of 1.5. That would cause a counterclockwise rotation, so it's positive. The other two forces, we have a 9.8 at 2 meters in the opposite direction, negative 9.8 times 2, and then a negative 20, 23.5 times 6 meters, perpendicular distance of 6 meters. So that gives us what we need for our reaction force at B. B is 107 kilonewtons in the positive x direction. Um, then we can go in with our summation of forces in X and Y. We could have started with our summation of forces in Y too, right? Um, we only have three forces in the Y direction, A, Y, this 9.8, and this 23. So we didn't have to wait and do this first, but we did. Um, and so A, Y equals 23.5 plus 9.8, um, which brings us to 33.3 kilonewtons. And then our summation of forces in X, we're going to find that B and A are a couple. They're equal and opposite. There are only two, um, are only two vertical forces. Okay. Let me do a time check. So let's take a look at this problem as well. Um, we have a cable with a tension of 150 kilonewtons. Determine the reaction at the fixed end E. So with this problem, where you create your free body diagram boundaries is going to be important. Um, if we were to analyze... This system, um, we're going to get a force here, right? Um, if we were to extend the boundaries of our system out here, we would get a force here. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Um, our, so let's break it off from the ground. Let's start with that, breaking it off from the ground. We can always kind of shrink it more, right? 
Um, so it was a fixed support. It's going into the ground. So we're going to have an X, a Y, and a moment impact on that, that reaction support. Um, and then our thread going in the same direction as the cable, our tension force in the same direction as the cable, which we have geometry. Um, we have distance values so that we can solve for the angle of this one. Easiest way to solve this, I would think, would be to then separate. We would find our lambda of this force, let's say D, DF, lambda of DF, um, which would be DF vector. DF vector would be 4.5I plus 6J, minus 6J. Um, divided by the magnitude of that, which would be the square root of the sum of the squares. Um, in doing that, you would break up your 150 kilonewton force into its X and Y impacts, which will then make both your moment calculations easier and um, your summation of X, summation of Y easier. So this is what I was kind of talking about mentioning early statically indeterminate reactions are if you have more unknowns than you have equations to solve for. Um, if we have enough equations, then we call it statically determinate. We can determine all of the conditions using our statics. Um, when there are more unknowns, that's when it's statically indeterminate. Um, if we have more unknowns than equations, it's indeterminate. If we have fewer unknowns than equations, um, we are partially constrained, meaning we're missing some information. Um, and then equal number unknowns and equations. Oh, yeah. E we want an equal number of unknowns and equations. This one just has that it's improperly constrained, um, which is not relevant right now. Okay. Um, equilibrium in a rigid body in three dimensions, like we said. We now have six equations. We have our moment in X, Y, and Z and our summation of forces in X, Y, and Z. Um, our reaction supports and reaction forces are going to be pretty similar. I feel like for the most part, um, once students get familiar with our 2D reaction supports, they usually are pretty intuitively able to grasp these. Um, so our first one is where it's only constraining perpendicular to the ground or the contact point. Um, so we have a ball picture, it's like a ball socket um, and it's just able to free rotate anywhere. It's able to move translationally. It's just not able to go through the ground. Frictionless surface would be the same type of thing. Um, roller, we're gonna be constrained to move along the axis of the roller. Remember that we're adding in um, we're adding in forces in the ways that our our reactions are not able to move. Um, so in this case, we wouldn't be able to move this way, right? Because we would be just kind of skidding on that side of that thing. We're also not able to go through the ground here. Um, picture if you see a roller, picture it's kind of on a rail for the most part. Um, in this case, it's, so this one is like a free rotating ball, this one. So I was saying like, picture there's a socket in, in this, that's in the top part. I don't know what's going on with my mouse. Um, down here, we have a socket that is fixed to your ground support. Um, so it's constraining your motion in every way, except rotation. We're still able to rotate. Right, we're just not able to translate to slide. Don't worry about this particularly, don't worry about that. Um, these ones it could be fun to look at, it could be worth noticing. Um, but this would be the only one that you would really need to know for our class, and it's that a fixed support in three dimensions is going to constrain all translation and all rotation. 
Any questions? Okay. So our test is going to be on the Friday before spring break. That's not you. Our test is going to be on March 10th. Um, so that's going to be a week and a little bit. Um, if you are not able to, if you're wanting to travel for spring break um, and you have a free Wednesday evening, talk to me about coming for their test. So another section of the class will have the test um, on the 8th. So I know that some people travel, so just be aware of that. Um, okay, let's take a look at some of these questions. So the main things on the test, you are going to have one unit vector question. Um, you are going to have one dot product question dot product to find the angles between two vectors. Um, and then you will also have a cross product question. Technically, couples are in this section. Um, so if we look at our syllabus, our first unit goes through, um, I think through here, um, but the last thing on that section is not on the quiz. Um, it's going to be the same type of thing. We're going to have our quiz is going to be cover moments. Equivalent force systems is difficult. I would say that's not on the test. Um, that would be a test three type of topic. Um, three questions, 90 minutes. Um, I have some problems to study, but I'm going to be honest and say that I think that these are not necessarily the best. What I would suggest though, determine the moment about the origin of the force that acts at point A, assume the position vector of A is. So these would be good questions. These would be good questions to practice. There'll be one question that's kind of similar to these. Um, not that one. This one, this one's a good one to study. Um, I don't remember offhand with this one. No, because our dot product is going to be this angle question. Um, let's go grab that again. That's actually. Let's do this. find it. Here we go. Okay. This is what I'm talking about. So what this equation is, it says the dot product between vector P and vector Q equals the magnitude of P times the magnitude of Q times cosine theta, where theta is the angle between P and Q. If you were to have, so um, if you were to, because you're going to be determining these cables, right? So this is the equation you're going to need to find the angle between cables. The dot product is like terms multiplied together and then sum together. So the dot product between P and Q is going to be PX times QX plus PY times QY plus PZ times QZ. It's gonna be a scalar number, meaning there's no direction. So we're just getting a number out of it. So our, our magnitudes we know, right? That's the square root of the sum of the squares. Because you're gonna be doing that in a question kind of more like this um, for your test two, 
determine uh, the angle form between AB and AC. So generally, assume tension. Um, so in this case, I would assume going from A to B, going from A to C. However, if you did have one in the wrong direction, oops. if you did have one in the wrong direction, picture on this slide that we have Q. If Q were going in the opposite sense, the angle between P and Q we would get would be this other side of it. So it's not technically wrong. Um, Okay, let's look at, let's do the second part of it. This, determine the angle formed by AD and AB. Um, so to go from A to D, we need to go, um, there's zero X. There is a Y value from A to D of, oh, I'm sorry, there is an X. There's negative 14 X and negative 48y and 0z. Um, AD, kill me, equals negative 14i, 48j. Okay, um, A to B, A is gonna go, so we'll have AB is 16, I, right, from here, negative 48J, this should be negative as well. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. And then is there a Z value on this one? There is, we're gonna move forward 12Z or 12K. Okay, so the dot product between AD and AB is going to be that first value, those first values multiplied. So it would be negative 14 times 16 plus our second values multiplied together, 48 times, negative 48 times negative 48. Um, so it'll give us positive 48 squared. And then our last one would be 12 times zero. Um, so we would find the value for this, set it equal to the magnitude of AD is going to be the square root of 14 squared plus 48 squared. Um, the magnitude of AB would be 16 squared, square root of 16 squared plus 48 squared plus 12 squared. So then we get an inverse cosine of those to find our angle. Questions on this? Okay. I think we have a couple minutes left. So I'm going to just go into the next one so we can do more like test practice problems when we get back in. Um, won't go too crazy though. Just kind of introduce the next topic. So the next topic that we're talking about is centroids. Um, what a centroid is, is the geometric center of something. So when we look at, so you probably are more familiar with the term like center of gravity, right? Center of gravity is the center of mass. Center of gravity, center of mass are the same thing. Centroid is going to be that on a geometric scale rather than a weight scale. So if each like square inch had a weight, it would pull it over to that to that area. Um, when we have plates that are consistently thin, consistently weighted, or anything that's consistently thin, consistently weighted, the centroid and the center of gravity would fall in the same location. Um, To um, so the first moment is the measure of an object's resistance to change its rotation 
based not on the material, right? So you have, if you were to have a beam, um, if you're to have a beam, <laughs> you're to have a tall beam, um, two things contribute to how much deflection you get in that. The first thing is the material of the beam. Are you using stronger steel or what are you using? Do you have a, a less rigid, a more flexible material Then you're gonna get more deflection in it without breakage? The other thing that contributes to an object's resistance to bending or a beam's resistance to bending is its cross section. Um, so I-beams are super, super common in construction. Um, and this is why. It's because this cross section is specifically resistant to bending. Um, the reason that it's resistant to bending, so what would our option be? We could either do this or we could just have a square type of thing. Um, what contributes to it resisting bending is um, how much material, the more material is away from the center line, the more resistance to bending it is going to be. Um, so if we were to look at, um, assuming these are to scale, if we were to look at this one versus this one, this one is going to have a higher um, first moment. Technically, our centroids come from integration, and that's what we're seeing up here. Um, focus on our 2D first. Technically, our centroids come from integration. The X centroid, so when we see this X bar or Y bar, that's the X centroid, Y centroid, respectively. So the X centroid, that X value of that location, times the area is equal to the integral of X dA. So if you have a shape, you can come up with its area equation, do that integration to come up with the first moment. Um, it's a little counterintuitive in that this one, where you use your x's, it's going to be your first moment with respect to y. And when you use your y's, that's going to be your first moment with respect to x. You will have to do that at some point, um, do the integrations for some more complex shapes. But in this class, we really we don't do much of that. Um, people have been integrating for a very long time. And so we have charts that cover what would the X and Y centroid be for these standard shapes, which then makes it a little easier for us to solve. Um, and we can kind of do proportion type things rather than doing that integration, right? Um, this would be something that I would recommend you print for your test, but this would not be a test two topic. Um, this would be a later test. So our, when we integrate, right, it's essentially coming from a summation, right? An integration is a summation of breaking everything into in infinitesimally small amounts so that you don't miss any detail. Um, when I first learned about integration, I remember I'm talking about integration is the same as the area under a curve, area same as summation. Um, so when we have odd shapes that don't make sense to us, that we can't pick something off of this chart to analyze, what we can do is break it up into shapes that we can analyze and then add them together. So what this equation is saying is big X bar or the X centroid of the whole object times the summation of area times the area of the whole object is equal to the summation, the addition of each individual elements, individual X bar, each individual. So like this triangle's X bar would be C1. This triangle's X bar would be C2. Each individual X bar times the amount of area that that shape is taking up. Um, so in application, this will be the last thing I think we do for the day. In application, we have this little um, plate thing, odd-shaped plate. Um, there is no nothing in the chart that will give this to us. However, if we break it up, we'll be able to get things. So 
The one thing that messes up people most frequently with this is make sure you are using one consistent coordinate axis for your centroid analysis. Um, so in this case, they gave us this X and Y axis. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, make sure you're being consistent that everything is compared to that same axis. Um, so first thing we have is a rectangle. A rectangle's X centroid and Y centroid are the easiest. Anything that has symmetry, the centroid will fall on the lines of symmetry. So if we have something that has multiple lines of symmetry, like this triangle does, our centroid is going to fall at the intersection of those lines of symmetry. Um, if we have something with a line of symmetry, with just one line of symmetry, we know that the centroid will fall on that line of symmetry, not necessarily where on that line. But so for rectangles aren't even on here because it's height divided by two, width divided by two. Um, okay, so here's our rectangle, the area of a rectangle, length times width. Our X bar is half of the width, 120 divided by two is 60. Our Y bar is half of the height is 40. When we go to our triangle, our triangles are going to, let's picture, our triangles are going to have, be one third towards the longer side. So if we have a triangle, so if we have a triangle like this, the longest side is here, right? Not, maybe that's not the right way to say it. Um, it's gonna be one third towards where there's more weight, right? Um, so if we, I guess I'm saying like the side opposite the point, I don't know. It's gonna be one third into it. Um, so in this case, it would be one third. Be cautious because sometimes your triangles are gonna be flipped. Um, so you wanna be one third towards where the weight is. Um, okay, so we have the 120 divided by three, and then we have the 60 divided by three, and it's below our X axis. I'm sorry, below our, yeah, below our X axis. So we have a negative Y value there. Um, semicircle. The one we had, we do have a line of symmetry. Circle, we have multiple lines of symmetry. So it's gonna be at the dead center of that circle. Um, semicircle, it's gonna be in that first line of symmetry. And then we need to grab our X value. Um, so we wanna go with our semicircle, not quarter circle. And our Y value is four R over three pi. We also have the areas here, so you can steal that information as well. So once you get the X by X bar and Y bar, you can multiply to get um, this half of the equation or to get the portions of it, right? Um, each individual components. Make sure that when we do this, count this one as a negative area, right? It is, it is negative space. It's not in there. We're subtracting it. Um, so make sure those values are negative to, to deduct from those spatial weights. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but um, okay. So then our equation that we have is big X bar, the X centroid of the whole system times the area of the whole system equals the summation of the individual elements. Sum these elements, divide by area to get our X value um, and divide by use our Y, divide by area to get our Y value. Any questions on that? Okay, oops. All right, um, no questions? Okay, I will post this um, so that you can look at it. I might cut off that end part.
uh, just because I know you guys are more tech savvy than I am. So, okay, I will see you guys on Friday then. Actually, do you have some time? Sure. Yeah, I don't know if we, if you ever like go over previous work, but for the life of me, I cannot finish this like last problem from the homework that's supposed to be due today. Like it's the one where we're supposed it's to find that the part B where it's that line of action, right? Is that what more or less? Think? It's the whole. It's the whole thing. If it's I'm being honest. Okay. So the last part of it, I am less worried about. Um, um, professor, before you yep. um, go on, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, because I sent an email. For me, I'm not able to submit the homework. Mm. There was no submission tab for it. OK. I don't know if you did that just recently. Mm, yep, no. Nope. Oh, you just did it now? Yeah, I'm doing it now. Uh, my bad, guys. I did kind of change. I'll get the rest of them. I think you might have to, to change the time as well because um, it is due for 10 o'clock this morning, technically. Yeah. Make it. Yeah, I always wondered, I always wondered about that, like why it's so, before class. Because then so I can go over it in class without having people just write down what I'm saying and then submit it. Uh, um, yeah, that's valid. It's just the fact that um I couldn't submit it last night and then that's fine. Let's yeah. make it let's make it do Thursday at midnight. Is that fair? That's fine. You'll be able to submit late too if if you are late. Um all right then. Well, that was just my question. Um okay. thank you. Yeah, thanks for letting me know about that. <laughs> yep. Not the best with my email. Okay. Um, okay, so that question. There it is. Yeah, this one. Okay, so my i feel like the way they phrased part b is very weird um and it's not necessarily something that we've even talked about um so with this one i'm definitely more concerned with part a um so there's a way to make this a lot easier so we have a roof of a building frame subject to wind loading is shown so on the left side from A to B on that AB linkage, we have like kind of symmetry there, right? And then same thing on B to C, we have symmetry there. Right. So what we can do, uh, I think I'm gonna download this. I don't know how to make notes on a Google Docs. I'm sure there's a way, but. Okay, so if we have, if they let, uh, I don't know why they're not letting me do that now. So if we separate this into half and we only look at this side, we have balance, right? Four hundreds equally spaced apart, and then we have A1 and A1, 230 pounds on either side. So if we were to go dead center, the moment impact, hmm. if we were to analyze the moment about that center point, there would be no moment because it would be balanced. Everything creating a moment on this side would be balanced by something creating an opposing moment on this side. So we could simplify this problem to be there's one force here. That's the magnitude of all these forces. So it would be 800 plus 460. So I guess that would be 1260. Um, so we'd have a 1260 force going down in the middle of this AB thing. And then on this side, it would be 
pretty much the same, but it's a positive Y element instead of a negative Y element. Right. Um, so then that would give us just two equations to solve for. Um, the, so what they did too is created a, an equation for the force vector. We know the vector, we know the direction of AB um, because we have this geometry here. We have 40, nope, sorry, 30 feet X and 10 feet in the Y direction. So these forces are gonna be hitting that perpendicularly. So it's going to be, you're gonna to have to switch your, I don't know how to phrase that. If, hmm, so let's, so you essentially have to switch your, your signs, right? Um, so our AB has one, a one to three ratio, one in the Y direction and three in the X direction. So the forces that would be perpendicular to it would have three in the Y direction and one in the X direction. Does that make sense or did I lose you there? No. I, yeah, you can leave. You can leave whenever you want. Um, okay. So our force is going to be perpendicular to that. Um, then if we have the magnitude of the force, we can break it up into its X and Y components to make it a little easier to solve. Um, F prime. So F and F prime is just, F is going to be on this side, this BC value. And F prime is going to be this AB value. And I just know that because of the negative Y element here. Um, so then we go into our resultant force is the summation of the two forces. Their Y element would cancel and we would just end up with twice the X element, right? Because we have equal negative here as positive here. Right. Um, we can go about our moment equation by using our R cross F. Um, where would this be applied now that I'm doing that? So um, our values, so where we put our re reaction or our uh, boil down versions of our forces, we put them in between here. So it would be at 25 feet tall, right? It's this halfway point in here. So that's where we get this 25J times the, so perpendicular distance times the force magnitude. Um, even though our, these cancel, they still have a moment, it's cancel in summation of why they still have a moment impact. Um, so we're gonna have a, why is it 15? Because it would be the Y value. Because it would be the Y value. And so 15 and half of 30. Okay. So 15. So picture we're analyzing like this center point down here, kind of, right? Um, and then for the opposite one, it would be plus 15 instead of minus 15. So 30 plus 15, you get the 45. And then that's your three impacts from your moment. Are we still on board? Um, <clears throat> a little less. Yeah, it's just where would, if if it's two dimensional, like what's, what's the K? Like I thought K was only meant for like if it's a three dimensional viewing. It, yeah, it kind of is. But um, our moments, our moment vector is what we're rotating around. So if we're rotating, counterclockwise or clockwise, it's actually considered to be going around a K vector. Um, so if you picture that you were staring the vector in the eye, the moment vector in the eye, the moment is gonna be rotating around that. It's just kind of how we call them, how we designate them. So this is the axis that we're rotating around. I see. <clears throat> Got it or no, like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm following through. Okay, good. And then this one I'm definitely less concerned about because we have never really 
refer to it like this. Yeah, I was going I was going through the slides as I was like trying to solve and I didn't find anything about that. Yeah, yeah, I feel like we need to kind of rewrite this problem. Um, because if I'm being very honest with you, I'm not really even sure what they are trying to say here. So I wish I could be more help, but the I'm first part is definitely more relevant. Um, don't worry about the second part as much. If you want to submit it without part B, that's fine. I was literally just about to ask about that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Because I, I like, I kind of get what they're trying to say, but not totally. So, yeah. All right. Well, then I'll have this right. submitted by the end of the day then. Perfect. I think it's open till Thursday night now. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. I'll see you guys on Friday. See you on Friday. I just have a quick